Uh, hello and welcome everyone uh, to this webinar on the Ruang and Kibor administrative areas in monoethnic political organization in South Sudan, uh, hosted by the Small Arms Survey and its Mapping Actors and Alliances Project on South Sudan. My name is Christopher Carlson. I'm the coordinator of the project as well as the HSBA project on Sudan and South Sudan. Um, thank you again for joining us today and taking a moment uh, to peel yourself away from the unfolding events in Ethiopia and Sudan. Topics uh, for another webinar for another day. Um, just a few comments uh, before we shift uh, over to our panelists and, and be commence uh, our discussion. Um, we're recording the webinar today. Uh, this will be available on the Small Arms Survey's YouTube page. Uh, it is there that you will also find another uh, or, or previous uh, webinars uh, on the split on the SPLAIO, um, as well as other panel discussions on Jongole State, Unity, uh, and Upper Nile, among other uh, webinar uh, events that we've held here. Um, uh, in addition, you can find our uh, briefs that are linked to these webinar topics. Uh, these briefs are available through the maps.org website. Or you can also visit the HSBA project page um, at the Small Arms Survey uh, website, that's smallarmsurvey.org. Um, if you're new to the Mapping Actors and Alliances project, please visit the website. I'll post it in the chat box uh, in a moment. That's maps.org. From there, you can access the database of profiles on actors and armed groups in South Sudan, uh, some of whom will be featured in today's discussion. Um, with uh, regard to today's webinar, um, if you have questions, which I hope you do, I encourage you to use the Q&A function uh, down at the bottom of your screen and not the chat box to uh, deliver your questions. This will help us keep those organized and make sure that we can get to a number uh, of those questions and as many as possible um, during the Q&A period. Uh, without further ado, um, let me introduce our panelists today. I'm very excited uh, to have two additional panelists who have uh, agreed to join us since I sent out the announcement last Friday. Um, Diana Felix da Costa and Joseph Lillemoy, uh, thank you to both of you uh, for taking the time to join us today. Uh, Diana Felix da Costa is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Development Studies in the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, uh, where she also did her PhD. She has been researching in what is now the GPAA since 2011, and her current research investigates the youth in crisis narrative by better understanding the Merle age sets and how these have been changing and relate to regional and national political dynamics. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to hearing from Diana today. In addition to Diana, uh, we also have a very special guest, Joseph Lillemoy. Joseph is a former senior member of the South Sudan Democratic Movement uh, in Army, the Cobra faction. Uh, he was the chief uh, political affairs and spokesperson um, in the movement, in the political military high command of the faction. During the peace talks with the national government, Joseph was the deputy chairman of the Cobra faction negotiation team. After the establishment of the GPAA by the Republican decree uh, of July 2014, Joseph was appointed as Deputy Chief Administrator of the GPAA. He also served as Advisor for Peace and Reconciliation and as Minister of Finance and Economic Planning in 2016 and the Minister of General Education from 2018 to 2020 in Boma State. At present, Joseph is the Minister of Finance and public service in the Greater Peebo Administrative Area. Joseph, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and in addition, uh, my two very familiar colleagues, uh, Ferry Marco, who is a researcher of the Small Arms Survey, uh, and Joshua Kreis, um, who will be I, more or less moderating our event and kicking things off in just a moment to introduce the topic and start today's panel discussion. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions, please post those anytime you like in the Q&A function. And I look forward to the event. Joshua, over to you. Thank you, Christopher. 
So the paper that Matt's put out, as you probably know, is on Rueng State. But we thought that rather than do just an event looking at the political dynamics of Rueng, it would be an occasion to really think about administrative areas. And administrative areas, both in the sense of Rueng and Pibor, but also in the broader sense of what it means that when Ferry and I were doing fieldwork in Ekobo, what we heard from the Lonur often was what we want is an administrative area just like the Merle have. So what does it mean that around the country, we have all sorts of people asking for administrative areas? What's the promise offered by an administrative area? And first, by looking at people and rowing, thinking about, well, can the administrative area actualize that promise? And what sort of tensions within politics in South Sudan is that desire expressing? What sort of ruptures within the same of the freight of the state, the relationship to the government in Juba is expressed in the idea that we need or people need administrative areas. So the way that we're gonna do this, we wanna take advantage of Joseph being here and he can't be here unfortunately for the whole thing is that we're gonna begin, <coughs> excuse me, by Diana offering just a brief overview of the dynamics that led to the creation of the GPAA. And then we're gonna have Joseph talk about that process and reflect on it. And then if you have questions for Joseph, then please put them in the Q and A panel and we can pose them to Joseph. And then after that sort of 20 minutes, I'll spend 15 minutes talking about Rueng and about the recent paper we published. And then we're gonna draw back and via ferry have a more general discussion about the relationship of ethnicity to administration in South Sudan right now, and then move over at the end to a period of question and answers. And as ever, please put your questions in the Q&A box and then I will deal with them and give them to the participants as they come up. So first off, it's over to you, Diana. What led to the creation of the GPAA? Uh, thanks, Joshua. And like you said, I will be very brief, uh, especially because we do have Joseph to speak well about the internal dynamics and really what, well, who is behind the creation of the GPA specifically. But so, so I'll be speaking really briefly over the dynamics that led to the creation of the GPA and how it's evolved since it was first established in May 2014. Uh, and the foundations behind the area also connect to the, 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 the particularities uh, of the GPA that help to understand the area, the promises and the challenges that it faces. So I guess the first point is that contrary or different to other administrative areas, uh, to Rueng and other hopeful communities that, like you've mentioned in Akobo, uh, that would like to have their own administrative areas, the GPA is actually ethnically heterogeneous and home to four ethnic communities that live together in the area, sometimes more peacefully than other times and in, other, in some areas better and worse. Uh, of course, the larger Murle uh, group, the Anuak and the, the rather limited in number, uh, Kachipo and Gie. Uh, Jebel Boma in particular, in particular Jebel Boma County bordering Eastern Equatoria is actually home to three of these communities. Uh, this of course holds both challenges and opportunities. Uh, the area is ethnically dominated in terms of population and politically by the Mule, who are also the predominant force in the Cobra faction uh, that led to the creation and, uh, of, the, of the area and for independence from Drongle State. So this connects to the second point uh, that is also quite specific to the GPA. Uh, so the GPA is the direct result of not only a long, long political struggle, but also an armed struggle, uh, a two year war uh, between the Cobra faction uh, and the government's SPLA that culminated in, in May 2014 in the creation of the area. Um, so I guess after exhausting all political means and attempts at greater political representation and access to, to services through Zhongli State, the, Mur the Murle community through General Yao Yao, um, well, established the Cobra faction to, to, to separate from, with the ultimate aim of separating from Zhongli. Uh, the GPA is the product of the peace agreement that led to the end of the war. Uh, it was the first administrative area to be established. And, and I guess that's also important. It was May 2014, right at the start of the national conflict, uh, the broader national conflict. Um, and it's important to understand its creation also in the backdrop of this political and humanitarian uh, process or kind of pro, uh, dynamics. Um, it, this was an overstretched uh, national government and army compelled to negotiate uh, with the Cobra faction and address the greatest of its demands, which, which was the creation of a separate state. So it's not effectively a state, but it was an area. Um, and, and of course, also have the Murle on their side rather than potentially, uh, uh, well, kind of connecting to their, to, to Launuer uh, further in Akobo. Uh, 
Uh, this was the, the establishment of the ERI was not a unanimous decision. And uh, in going ahead with it, President Salva Kiir uh, ignored the interests of powerful figures in national and Jongle state. Uh, in particular, at the time, uh, then SKLA General, Staff, General Chief of Staff, uh, General Kwame Long, and Minister and former Minister of Defense, uh, General Kwame Nyang. Um, the political dynamics in the area were quite fragile at, at the start, uh, although to some extent, they have gained some more momentum and some uh, and relative permanence, but especially initially, they were very much connected uh, and predicated on the wider civil war. Um, at the moment, like other areas, its direct connection to the president's office means that it remains to some extent hostage to potential emerging ever changing political uh, priorities and alliances. So speaking very briefly of the initial period of euphoria and, and kind of joy once the GKA was created uh, on the ground, uh, despite the kind of intense pressures from either side, from the government side uh, and the IO side, the Cobra faction leadership and the GKA succeeded in remaining outside of the national conflict and forged quite good relations on both, on both ends, uh, not at just the political level, but also on the ground. So local level relations also improved quite significantly between those first 2014, 2015, those first years, uh, especially between uh, Murle and La Unuer. So even cattle raids carried out by individual uh, youth were often cattle was returned uh, by the, the government was quite adamant to return uh, cattle to, to, the, to areas where it was uh, raided. And uh, this actually can, for example, and this also connects to another quite important aspect of those first few years, which was the fact that the GPAA had the presence of the Cobra faction armed forces on the ground that were eventually integrated into the SKLA. But during those first few years, uh, the Cobra faction armed forces could actually ensure the security or contribute to the stability of the area, uh, not just in relation to intra, well, two areas, two issues within the, the GPA, but also in relation to its neighbors. Um, and they were quite helpful in supporting local government structures in managing local issues and intra GPA conflicts on the ground, but also in, well, in, for example, returning cattle to areas where they might have been raided from other, or other areas. So this is also kind of quite a specific dimension to, to the GPA in those first few years. Um, I guess there's also some, like a very, very strong argument to be made that the historical conditions and extreme marginalization of the Murle community and of Pibor County uh, that can be traced back to the colonial period and how the Murle have all kind of been portrayed and always understood um, as through the angle of their, of their more sort of politically dominant neighbors. Um, in the colonial, uh, initially in the colonial period, but up to now, you know, their relation to government has always been in relation to their Dinkabor, more powerful dominant neighbors. Uh, it, this can be traded, this makes the GPA sort of a better model that can deliver on political representation, people's sense of kind of a just a, a state that can be closer to them, better, more accountable and also relates to, to social and economic aspirations for the region. So of course, the kind of the ultimate question is, has it improved life for people in the GPA? And I guess because of, of its, its multi-ethnic or heterogeneous dimension, from whose, from whose perspective and, and um, has it improved? And probably the answer is, differently, is different in relation to, to, to people from, from different groups. Uh, there are several examples of where things have improved quite substantially. Uh, both in terms of security, uh, infrastructure, connecting the area through telecommunications uh, to the rest of the world. Pochala, from since last year, now has phone connection. Um, Boma is about to have phone connection as well. So all these are, are quite huge steps. Um, the most diverse county, Jebel Boma, home to the th to three ethnic communities, is has been on good terms. Uh, well, the communities in Jebel Boma have been on good terms for quite some time, and there are early me uh, warning mechanisms and systems in place where traditional author or customary authorities uh, are responsible and for uh, raising alarm should any minor incident happen that can quickly escalate. So there's a lot of sort of positive uh, issues to, to, to draw from. And there are, of course, also several key challenges that we can, well, or risks, potential risks. Um, the ethnic hierarchies in place. I mean, the Murle community are the dominant uh, community in the area, not just in terms of, of politically, and also because 
but also in population number, which dictates then their political uh, uh, well, uh, size politically. Um, but there are risks, of, of course, of replicating a ethnic marginalization or neglect that Murle previously experienced in Jongle. Um, there are also very limited resources tied to the office of the president, difficult to make socioeconomic changes. Um, but ultimately, I think what the, the GPA has led to uh, as well, that is to some extent a little bit abstract, uh, but it has um, it has renewed, it, it holds the promise of renewed relationship to the state, uh, one that has potentially, that is potentially more uh, accountable, responsive and just. Um, so I, I will not actually, I will not go any further, uh, just taking advantage that Joseph is with us and is able to speak from, from his own experience. Um, so so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Okay, Joseph, over to you. You just need to unmute yourself and then you can start. There we go. Yeah, are you getting me? Yeah, we can hear you great. Good. Well, uh, I'm saying that thank you very much for the opportunity. And I would like to express by my uh, thanks to Dr. Diana for connecting me with the uh, uh, Small Arms uh, Survey. Uh, it is my first time actually to be connected uh with uh, this organization i hope that uh i will uh, <clears throat> get another chance to uh share such forums uh in other times as a matter of fact um, the issue today is about the administrative areas in the republic of the south sudan and why uh, those uh, administrative areas have been uh, founded by the authorities in the republic of south sudan and why the people always asking for uh, having administrative areas. Uh, these are the points that I have right around here. From my experience as uh, uh, a member of Murle community, uh, the first uh, community to ask for uh, self-independent uh, in, uh, in Jungle State, uh, I can share some view uh, about this topic. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to give a little background about uh, the area, especially uh, Bibor administrative area. Uh, this area, as a matter of fact, is composed of two uh, major two counties of former Jungle State, uh, which is uh, Pashara County and, uh, and Bibor County. Uh, Pashara County is mainly inhabited by Anyuak community, uh, which are neighboring uh, Ethiopia. And also, uh, they have some uh, uh, branch in Ethiopia. And, uh, and Greater Bibor has three tribes. I mean, uh, the Bibor itself has three tribes of Murle and Shipo and Jie. Uh, so, when we were in uh, Jungle State, uh, there were some issues between the tribes in, uh, in Jungle State, which uh, accumulated and later on. Uh, with some communities who we call them minorities to ask for uh, independent uh, from the whole uh, Greater Jungle. Uh, the, the Greater Jungle itself has, has six uh, tribes, uh, Dinkabor, uh, Nuer, and uh, Murle, and Anyuak, and uh, Kashipo, and Jie. These six tribes are the population of Jungle uh, before it is split uh, into two. Um, because uh, within those tribes, there are something like four tribes who are mainly pastoralists and they have a uh, traditional conflict among themselves, which is um, uh, permitted by the uh, uh, kettle and also the shortage of the water, where they came to water points, the, 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 the share these this, this resources together. And as a result of that, they sometimes cause some conflict among themselves. So uh, in the beginning, it was merely uh, uh, community problems. It was not escalated to the level of the political uh, conflict. Uh, but when uh, the SPLM SPLA um, uh, established itself and moved to South and 
and most of the communities whom we used to fight with join uh, the SPLA, uh, the, the story has changed. You see now uh, the mobilization that was being uh, conducted uh, among South Sudanese communities, especially in Kimber State, uh, was different. Uh, for example, when the Dinka Corps had been mobilized to join the SPLA, they've been told that you have to come to SPLA so that you can get uh, 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 guns and nominations and fight uh, your neighbors who are Murle right, in order to bring back your cattle and also you can push them away from the areas so that you can have that area for yourself. And because those, those, those people are very uh, traditional and also they are very uh, push in number and their areas are not uh, uh, are not um, are very good for the living. As you know, there is a lot of blood and all of this. So they have decided to move and join the SVLM on that mission. And when they joined the SVLM, uh, when they came to the, to, the, to, the, to the movement, they have been thinking that whenever we get those weapons, we get the military mighty, we'll use them again as a military tribe so that we can push them away from the area so we can live in that area. This one, number two also, that we can uh, regain what they have took from us, like the cattle and all of this. So when they went there, uh, the Murle tribe have been suffering and the, 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 they refused to join the movement of the SPLA and they went and joined uh, the Khartoum uh, regime uh, for, for a while in order also to have um, the military equipment that, we, that they can defend themselves with it. So that was the beginning of the story. In 2006, after the signing of the CPA in 2005, uh, the forces that was under General uh, Sultan Ismail Konyi by then, um, they joined um, the, the National Army of uh, Sudan uh, in order to uh, uh, to, to protect themselves from the SPL who came to the area and all South Sudan being given to them. And uh, because uh, now the South Sudan is under the responsibility of the SPLA and the majority of the leadership that is uh, leading uh, the political uh, leadership in, uh, in, 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 in Jungle State is mainly led by the tribes that are fighting against the Murle. Uh, they put a strategic a strate a strategy uh, for themselves in order to fight uh, the, um, the communities going to the communities of uh, of greater people so that uh, they can uh, revenge against them uh, for two reasons. First, because in the, in the beginning of the movement, they do, not, they do not join the SPLA, and number two, uh, uh, they want to. Uh, achieve uh, the strategy that they put before the joining to the SPLA. So that was, uh, that was the beginning of the problem. And when we feel that as the youth, we feel that we are the target uh, of, uh, of the SPLA, uh, who is now leading the political power within the, Republic, within the Southern Sudan by then, we organize ourselves uh, as youth and we demand two things before we uh, raise arms against the government. We house uh, the government of the Republic of South Sudan under leadership of General Sakir Miyardi to, uh, uh, to divide Jungle State into two states uh, for, for, for the reason that we give him and he knows it. Uh, we tell him that we now became the target of the, uh, of the, of the, of the, of the two tribes who are majority in, uh, in Jungle State, which is the Lone Weir and uh, Inca Bor. And uh, we told them that the, the atrocities that was committed against the communities of, uh, of Murle and Anyuak and Kashiko uh, under their leadership uh, from 2005 up to 2009. Uh, and the second that we asked also uh, the president uh, to concentrate on development in our areas because the area was totally disconnected from the, from the, from, from the, from the rest of the, of the the country, we don't have good roads, uh, which can be possible during the rainy seasons. We don't have uh, schools, uh, we don't have uh, healthcare. Uh, if you go there, you'll find that the area is virgin. It's, it seems like 
uh, there is no any civilization to place since it was been created. So we have them as a government to help us and to, to establish good institutions and, uh, and to give ourselves to the area so that we can also um, feel that we are part of this country and we are part of the, of, uh, of the, of the nation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the central government failed to, uh, to listen to the communities in, uh, in this area, in the state. Uh, they sent a, a great uh, number of the SPLA army in order to disarm the civilians in the in, uh, in the port, especially the Mughal tribe. So when they went there, uh, there is a lot of human rights violation took place. Uh, there is a lot of records you can find them from the uh, angels who are operating in the area. Uh, those arms, and instead for them to go and disarm the civilians, they went and they revenge against the Muslim community, and uh, they start uh, uh, rampant killing of the civilians, and they committed uh, rapes against our women and our, children, our our girls who are there, and they make the life uh, very difficult for the people in Greater Bihar research area, especially in areas of Muslim. So as a result of this, uh, we feel that we have been marginalized and our voices have not been listened to. And we have decided uh, instead to use the peaceful means of asking for our rights, which is about uh, having our own independent entity uh, under uh, the leadership of the, of the, of the national government, uh, we resort to the armed struggle under the leadership of uh, General Jeff Yaoyao. Uh, this struggle started in 2010, in the beginning, uh, after the election of 2010. And uh, because we feel of, uh, uh, to continue because we don't have enough resources by then, and we don't have experience of doing such things, uh, we, uh, we signed a short-term uh, agreement with the government and we came in 2011. But after that, we resumed uh, our activities again in 2000. Uh, uh, and 12, uh, uh, and this time we organized ourselves very well, and uh, we fought uh, the, the government. From our side, we were been fighting the government in the English state in the beginning, uh, but we, unfortunately, the, 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 the government, the national level, and the team, uh, and became biased with the uh, government of Jungle, and they fought side by side, the, the government of the jungle state, and we, uh, we, we, we fought them, all of them, uh, the jungle state and the national government. And then uh, we end up with agreement in 2014, where we, we have been negotiating with the government, and we express about our grievances uh, very clearly. And, uh, and by then, of course, as you know, in 2013, the government was split to two and the foreign himself, the, the vice president and, and the president, uh, they were in drift and the fight himself and the, and the government became a little bit weak. And that was an opportunity for us to uh, negotiate with them and also to ask for our right. And uh, because also we have been looking for the alliances and uh, anyway, uh, we end up with an agreement which they call it uh, the State uh, Agreement on Resolution of the Conflict. And in that agreement, there are uh, three things that we, uh, we manage uh, to achieve to the communities in Greater Bigo. First, we have, been, uh, we have not been given full estate as we have been demanding, but we end up with administrative area. And the reason behind that it was that uh, the constitution uh, of the country is, is, is cannot allow to have uh, more than 10 states because it's uh, just stipulated there in the in one of the provision the agreement uh, that uh, you have to have only uh, something like a state but it's not a state we can call it uh, administrative area and then we accept it because it is only the name from our side uh, what we need as the Muslim community and the other minorities within the greater uh, bottom state area is to be independent from uh, the jungle states and uh, we accepted that. Uh, number two, um, uh, now we can have uh, 
representation in the various level of the government. We have a representation in the political power within our state, and we have a representation at the national level, especially in the legislative uh, assembly or the parliament. Uh, we have more than 18 uh, representatives now. I, I mean, uh, 18 representatives now in the national level who are MPs who can talk on behalf of the people of the Greater Big Bottom State of the Area. So that was uh, one of the things that we managed to, uh, to, to achieve uh, politically. Uh, number two, now we, uh, we start to uh, organize ourselves as the communities within Greater Big Bottom. And we are, we are taking the decision on ourselves. Nobody yeah. is, is going to take the decision on us. And we solve the problem that we have uh, among ourselves. Like uh, there was a problem between the rural community and here, uh, and Kashipo in other sites, and also with uh, Anyuan. Uh, the first thing that we did, we organized ourselves, and we uh, preached peace among ourselves, and we put our house in order. And we managed uh, to put the communities to live in coexistence and to have a very strong uh, social fabric as we are talking now. Uh, and now we are moving to the second step in order to, to have the peace with our neighbors, uh, which we mean that the Dinkapur and and, uh, and Nuer. So uh, that was the, the reason behind the establishment of the bottom state of area. And if we if we talk about South, South Sudan in all, there is many. Uh, other tribes who have the same feeling, feeling of like marginalization, and uh, and they have their grievances, and they want to take the greater people as an example uh, for them to have their own areas. Uh, but the government cannot allow that to happen uh, so, uh, unless uh, you have a good reason for that. Uh, recently, we have the, the the presidency has issued a decree uh, after the restating that the. the 32 states, uh, 10 states, uh, ruling have been given uh, their own administrative area because I think from my side of view, they have the same situation like Murle tribe. Uh, they are minority in the United States and as a result of that, that is why we can, uh, we can see that uh, they are uh, asking for that and they've been given that opportunity. So that is the reason. Uh, uh, to be short, um, one of the uh, challenges at the moment that we have in the area is that the area is very vast. It's very big, and and, and uh, the poor area is uh, uh, 33 and uh, 20, uh, 273 uh, kilometers square, and uh, Pachala is eight. Uh, uh, 8,380 uh, kilometers square, which is very big uh, area and very vast, and we don't have a good connection of the roads and all of this. So now our challenge is how we can uh, connect those areas together. And we have something like seven counties in the area uh, to, in order to reach uh, uh, those areas and to deliver services to them. We need uh, good uh, road and and, uh, and 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 network. So that is the challenge that we have now. We recently we met with the national authorities here, and they expressed it about the interest to uh, to open roads uh, which can connect uh, the greater development area with Juba uh, and Bor, and also with the neighboring uh, uh, the national borders like Tupia. Uh, and this now may happen in the coming dry season. This is the promises that we receive from the national government here. And uh, if we do that, I think that will be a great achievement. Uh, one of the achievements that we did, as uh, Mr. Diana has mentioned, uh, we managed to cover the area with a uh, communication uh, network. Uh, as we are talking now, uh, you can talk with, uh, uh, with, with, with people uh, from Juba here, uh, you can talk with people in Pachala and in Puma and also in Bibor. Uh, so we remain only with a very few counties, which we talk with the companies who are working in, uh, in, in, this, in this field to connect us with them. They're going to empower uh, the signal in uh, Bibor uh, areas like Gumruk and Likwangle. So uh, just after uh, 
uh, one month, uh, I mean, two months from here, we will be having a good uh, communications all over the area. And uh, that will help us in, in a lot of uh, issues, especially in terms of uh, business and, uh, and keys, and also uh, in terms of security. Uh, so this is one of the achievements that we managed to achieve in the area. Uh, also now, uh, we used to have only one uh, secondary school in the area, but as we are talking now, uh, we have uh, three uh, secondary education, and we have uh, many schools all over the counties and payams. Uh, they are not operating very well, but anyway, we have started uh, the, the areas like uh, Kazimor, which is very far from Buma, uh, is nearing uh, Eastern uh, Equatorial State. We have now a school there uh, for GA communities. And also we have schools in Meun, uh, in, uh, in Kashipu areas near uh, Kukia. Uh, and, 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 and we think that if we continue uh, with that uh, uh, spirit uh, within uh, one year, there will be change in the level of education. Uh, so that all, the, all, all this is because uh, by the virtue of the, by the virtue of uh, uh, of, of having our own independent area, which is totally under our responsibility, although we don't have resources. Uh, finally, which I would like to say that uh, the, the international communities uh, and the angels and, and everybody who's willing to help and to use assistance to the communities in greater people, uh, they should now come because uh, uh, we have achieved uh, relevant uh, piece in the area. Uh, recently, we, we talked with our neighbors uh, uh, from Vinkabor and, uh, and Lonewear, and we reached to an agreement. And the area now is going for six or seven months now. There is no any uh, reported uh, cases of, uh, of violence uh, in the border. And also, uh, and Murle, who used to fight among themselves, and now uh, settle the issues and they're living in peace. And so the area is, uh, is ready uh, for everybody who wants to come and see the community in the field that I've mentioned, so like education and health and whatsoever. Uh, the area is, is ready because the, conduce, the environment is conducive now to any activities. Um, also, uh, we, we have uh, some problem in the, in the private sector uh, due to the uh, poor uh, roads. We don't have um, uh, good markets in the, in the area. And, uh, and that is why we are now trying to invite uh, investments in the area. And there is something like three or four uh, companies who recently like, expressed it uh, about their uh, readiness to come and to invest in the area, especially in Jebel Buma and uh, Marwa uh, in, uh, in tourism. So uh, we, actually, we think that uh, in, the, in the beginning of the new year, uh, we'll be able to see uh, some uh, uh, developments in the area. Uh, I will stop here. Uh, if there is any question relating to uh, greater be what administrative area, I'll be ready to, uh, uh, to share. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joseph. I encourage anyone in the audience if they have questions about the GPAA or anything Joseph said to post questions. I will lead off with one of my own. You said that there are many communities who now want administrative areas and the government is going to resist that. Let, if we leave aside for a moment the government resistance, could you imagine that as a possible model for South Sudan, where effectively every community gets an administrative area? Would that strike you as a better model than the current model of often very large, unwieldy states? Thank you very much, uh, Yeshua. Uh, this is not a good model, of course, uh, because uh, there is no any means for a country uh, to be divided among themselves. Uh, the spirit of nationality cannot allow that. Uh, but the problem is that um, uh, the long period that we had in the, uh, in the civil war uh, between uh, Sudan and, uh, uh, and Southern Sudan that has created 
uh, a lot of issues between the communities in, uh, in the area. You know, we have more than 64 tribes uh, in, uh, uh, in South Sudan. Uh, but uh, as you, if you come to uh, the representation of, this, of those tribes in the level of the government, you'll find that uh, most of the tribes are not represented at all. And also, if you, if you also look at the terms of, uh, uh, of development, you'll find out that there is some areas who are under development, like greater big bottom areas, and also some areas in, uh, uh, in North South Sudan, I find that there is some areas who have been neglected uh, for no reason. Uh, all the resources have been here in the center. And the same problem that we have been, uh, uh, that caused a problem between the northern south is now existing. So that is why we are uh, not happy. But we have our independent uh, administrative areas as tribes or as uh, ethnic groups is not uh, uh, a solution for the problem in South Sudan. Uh, the, the, the solution is that the people should uh, accept each other and also should uh, divide uh, the national dividends piece among themselves. So that is a, that, that what can I say? This is not a good model anyhow uh, for the for the tribes or for anybody who feeling that he is not uh, feeling comfortable uh, to house for administrative area. Uh, but this. Uh, temporary solution for the problem that we have. Great, thank you, Joseph. Ferry, I believe you have a question, so it's over to you. Yes, thank you, Joseph, it's fascinating. And I have, I have two questions, actually. They're coming one from the other. The first one is you several times mentioned the difference between a state and an administrative area. And you also said that this is a difference we accepted because it's only on name. But can you elaborate on, on this of what is the difference between a state and an administrative area, from your perspective as an administrator, and also from the perspective of, of, uh, of the Mule. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, for the Mule tribe, for example, the, uh, their, 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 their demand was to have their own independent uh, uh, area from uh, greater from particular states. Uh, whether it is given a name or not given a name, although the one, the one to have independent uh, entity which they will be able to decide their own issues by themselves, and uh, also uh, where they can have a voice to be heard by the uh, national uh, government. Uh, in the past when we were uh, a county, uh, if we have any issues that we want to raise with the national government, it should go through the leadership in the state. And sometimes those uh, demands or those uh, uh, issues that we raised uh, did not wish uh, to the national level, so we block it in the middle. But now we can, our voices can be heard. Uh, we, can, we can meet uh, the authorities in the national level and we can express about our preferences and our problems that we have in the area. Uh, so uh, for the, from the perspective of the community, that they, don't, they don't care about the difference between uh, state and administrative. But from my point of view, uh, as uh, Joseph, uh, uh, administrative areas uh, is not there in the, in the constitution uh, of the Republic of South Sudan, which, which means that uh, it is not legal uh, at the moment because it is not there. So the legal status for the administrative areas is very important. Uh, when we signed the agreement with the government and they said that they're going to give us uh, administrative area, we questioned them about the period that we should have uh, as uh, administrative area, how long we're going to be administrative area and which is, what is going to determine our status in the future. They told us that uh, if uh, we manage to uh, organize a constitutional conference for the country, that is where you can uh, decide uh, your status, whether you're going to be state or you're going to be uh, an administrative area or you're going to rejoin the, your, your mother state, in the state. Uh, and when we, when we accepted that and we came uh, to uh, Juba, uh, after one uh, year, uh, 
uh, we became a state, a boom state. Uh, as I told you, the boundaries have remained the same. We are, we are constituted of uh, Pashala County and Dibor County, the two counties of former Dune State, which is splitted from it. And, 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 and we, we divide uh, Dibor County into five counties, and we divided uh, uh, Pashala County into two counties and became seven counties, which constituting the Greater Dibor Administrative Area. But when we have been uh, promoted as a state uh, in 2015, uh, we kept the same borders. It's only the name that has changed. It is the same borders, uh, it is the same counties, it is the same people, uh, the four tribes that we have. So it is only the names. But uh, we expected that uh, 32 state will be uh, incorporated into the constitution and we'll be, ha we'll be having legal status. But uh, recently, due to the current agreement that was signed between the IO and the other political parties in the government, uh, they restated the, the, uh, the 10 states and we've been resorted to our to uh, we maintain our status as uh, administrative area with the same border and with the same communities that we have in our area. Uh, now we are three administrative areas. Uh, the decision is going to be taken uh, by the people that follow South Sudan after uh, election of 2000, uh, I mean 2023, uh, will determine the status of those three administrative areas from our side we cannot accept to go back again to our former uh, jungle state, and we're expecting that uh, we'll be promoted again to uh, state. That is what, what, what I expect. Uh, Great, thank you, Joseph. I'm conscious of time, but we have a question from the audience, and I want to take advantage of you being being here. And the question is, what might help reduce violent age set fighting in the GPAA? Uh, the age set fighting. Mm. What well, might help H reduce it is the, yes. is the question. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, for the age of fighting, it is um, uh, it's traditional. It is not a problem at all within the community of the Murmi. Uh It has just become a problem because in the in the in, in the past uh, when. Uh, the, the new emerging uh, assets uh, came up. The fight, the fight with the with the, with the one who is already existing uh, in the in the, uh, uh, in the community. Uh, the fighting was uh, we used sticks, but even before the stick, we we, we were been wrestling uh, in nineteen fifties. Uh, 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 there was no the sticks fighting between the assets. Uh, what was there is wrestling. We wrestle, and and, uh, and when we find that the the upcoming uh, generation is stronger, then uh, they will be given authority now to lead the community. Uh, and these things has uh, graduated. I mean, um, have been upgraded, uh, and and people and the, and the Aces start to fight with the sticks. And even this one also, we we imitated from the our neighbors from. Uh, uh, Toposa uh, in, 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 in 60s, uh, some of our uh, elder generation, they went and, and uh, to the areas of Toposa and they start uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to see those people who are there, how do they live? They find them, they are fighting with the sticks. And when they come, they start to use the sticks among themselves. And it was also the problem because uh, there was no uh, uh, serious casualties taking among themselves. But now, uh, after the civil war and everybody has learned to use a gun, uh, this is where the problem has started. Uh, people have guns in their hands and when they are fighting, they start to use these guns uh, and these things tend to be bloody among the, uh, the, the, the use especially between the ASAT groups. And you have to know that in one family, uh, you can find a parent's 
have uh, two different asset groups. So when this when when, when the fighting is cut uh, uh, between those asset groups, you'll find two brothers can fight himself, and one can be uh, can lose his life. Uh, so this is uh, something which is not there. Uh, but now we are trying to restore uh, our good tradition and, and custom uh, of the community. Uh, we have a plan as a government to intervene and to uh, regulate the arms that uh, within the communities. Also, uh, according to the national plan uh, of the country, they are going to have uh, collective disarm and the uh, entire uh, country. So that will be some of the solution to the problem. But the asset itself is not a problem. It is uh, social structure, social organizations uh, that we have within the community. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I'm conscious of time, so we should probably move on briefly to Rueng. If you're able to stay for the debate after worrying about administrative areas more generally, that'd be wonderful. Um, but otherwise, I've learned so much. So thank you so much for coming on. And I hope you get to come on again and have further discussions in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, is there anybody going to talk about the, the ruin? Then I can yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the ruling. Okay, sure. Okay, good. Yeah. Could you put yourself on mute, if that's okay? Just because there's background noise. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So we've just learned a lot about the first administrative area, and I'm just going to talk briefly because you can read it all in the text that we put out last week or earlier this week um, about Rueng. The... So the Rueng Administrative Area is founded in February 22, but of course builds on the 32 states, both of which allotted Rueng their own state. <clears throat> and that builds on a long history in Rueng of deep anxiety about being part of unity. And this anxiety goes back really to the Second Civil War and to the fact that, of course, it is this small Dinka rump community in the north surrounded by newer forces. And so when you go to Rueng, I was there last month, the continual memories are of the occupation of land or the claimed occupation of land uh, by the lake and by the Jikan Nur in places like Panaquach. And then the sense that after 2005, there's the hope that, okay, maybe now we can participate in a project of autonomy and they find themselves deeply marginalized within the majority newer politics of unity states. Administrators were constantly complaining, we couldn't get jobs, we can't have any influence in Bentiu, and yet there's this consistent claim that, and yet we have all the oil, and yet we have Alin, and yet we have the fields, so why are we not getting any of this money? And this sort of basic sort of sense of economic injustice, I think, really comes to a head in 2010, when we have initially, when Montuil is going to go up against Mashar, and, and Montuil is blocked um, in Juba. And so rather than, um, rather than Nguyen, they decide that to go up against, so rather than um, Nguyen, they decide that the, the government candidate, the Juba candidate is gonna be to Bandengai. And to Bandengai is gonna get the official nomination. He blocks out Nguyen for the official nomination. And so as Nguyen is not running, the Mashar candidate becomes um, his wife, uh, Nyakwech. And so you have this battle between Nyakwech and Taban Dengai in which the Rek Dinka come onto, uh, to the, the Dinka of Pariang and the Dinka of Rueng and say, look, you need to back Taban Dengai. We can't have a repetition of the split in the, S in the SPLA that happened in the 90s. We can't have an attack. And this way, because the newer constituency is divided, there is going to be a much bigger voice for the Rueng in Bentu. And initially, some of the appointments seem to go that way, 
But what actually they find is that the there is just as little influence and they're not getting explicitly any of the oil money and that many of the places that have been occupied during the Second Civil War, such as Manga, such as Panaquach, continue to be occupied. And indeed, one of the things that Taban does is to continue to build farms along what are now contested areas. And I think really the war ended for a lot of um, for a lot of the Dinka of Ruang, the idea that something like a multi-ethnic politics was gonna be possible. So not only did the division four divide in Bentiu along ethnic lines, but I was in um, Pariang the year after, so in, in December, 2014, and the memories were still fresh of the violence of the division of the military there and the way that suddenly Ruang found itself deeply isolated from the rest of, of, um, of unity. And so it began to build its own self-defense forces, funded in part by the National Security Service to defend the oil fields. And so part of what the emergence of the Padang as a major, relatively major Dinka power block was, was to demand the relative autonomy of Ruang and something like a central Apanao state or a northern Apanao state in Apanao, which we've talked about on previous webinars. And really the administrative area this time is the actualization of the continuity of that project, the relative dominance of at least a few Ruang politicians who were able to push that agenda in Juba. And then the question is, well, how's it going? And the answer is not very well at all, really quite badly. And I think there's a few different reasons it's going really badly. One of which is that the emergence of the administrative area has come about at the same time as there are a number of splits within the Dinka community in Ruang. So one of the most obvious splits is between the Panaru Dinka and the Alor. We'll leave aside the Pauing because the Pauing, for reasons we'll come to, have less power. Like the Panaru Dinka classically, Andma Bek Lang, were the, the Dinka section that controlled the politics largely of Ruang. And the Alor, who are largely in Abiemnom, are the, the junior constituency, as it were, the less powerful partner. And for a while now, the Alor have felt both marginalized, but also unable to respond to threats from the Bulnu and Mayom. And so we've had two um, chief administrators in a row now, um, William Chol Awalith and then Peter Monijok Dao, the current administrator, who are both a Lordinka. And within Pariang and within Mabek Lang's constituency, which is still probably the most powerful political constituency in Ruang, there's a great deal of hostility to those appointments. So that's problem number one. So put otherwise, Though we now have a monoethnic area, administrative area, the emergence of that as a monoethnic area has allowed for a division within that group between two sections that are now contesting the area. So the, the idea that there was at this moment some sort of wonderful um, unity within the Ruang Dinka has proved to be illusory. Reason number two is that fundamentally there's a massive split in terms of the division of the organization of resources. So in the west of Ruang, what you have is the control of the oil fields. And there's been huge divisions within the Panaru Dinka around, for instance, Elin Payam, about what percentages should go to which of the Payams according to whether they produce that much oil or should it just be like the three, sorry, three counties now, the three counties that produce oil that should each get 1% or should it go to a broader Ruang constituency? And the argument very much is no, what we have is oil. And so the contestation there at both the Juba level in terms of the formation of these committees, but also in Pariang has been about how to get that oil. The reaction to that in the East has been to say, fine, you have the oil, we have our own extractive industry, we have humanitarianism. And so there's been a series of claims that, for instance, the demands for localization that have accompanied youth protests that have been going on around um, South Sudan, including in Pibor, of course, has uh, the demand for many of those youth organizers has been in Jamjang County, which is where Ashim Tok and Pamir are the two big refugee camps are for the Nubians, um, the Nubians of the South, it shouldn't be the people of Ruang who get local jobs. It should be just the Kwadgir and the Ajang, the two subsections from, from uh, Jamjang County. So their claim has been, look, okay, there isn't, a, there isn't a Ruang people here. What there is, is a need to fight for scarce resources under conditions of economic austerity that has effectively divided up uh, the Ruang administrative area into these two very different economic patterns of extraction. One is substantive and real. There are real resources still 
in the refugee camps, despite the amount of resources that have been withdrawn due to COVID and economic deficits. And the, there are at least potential resources from the oil, though, of course, we've seen that that um, have, are not yet forthcoming. So then the third fundamental reason that there's been this division is that the promise of Rueng was fundamentally a promise that said, we will now have autonomy from the Nur. But the reality is that formal autonomy in the sense of having the administrative area has not meant substantive autonomy. And in many ways, I think Rueng is now actually weaker than it was when it was a part of unity and less able to influence the politicians that actually control politics from Rueng. So I'll give you a couple of examples of that, but the most important example, of course, is Taban Dengai. If there's a single message which is clear throughout Rueng, it is that everyone hates Taban Dengai and they wish Taban Dengai has nothing to do with the politics because, you know, he stole the oil money, he has men in Panaquaj. But if there is a single truth to almost every single politician in Rueng, is that they owe their, they owe their political position to, to Bandengai. Since 2010, he's managed to involve himself in, and in very complicated ways, it's not simply that he's um, somehow, like he he's like runs the, the administration, but rather that everyone at some level owes something to him. Many people, for instance, owe their positions to him because when he came back in to the, um, to the SPLA, he negotiated rank rises and rank promotions for many of the politicians from the Rueng who remained loyal to him. Many other of the politicians in the current administration owe their positions to a series of politicians who are largely based in Juba, but who are, for a variety of reasons, beholden to him. So that's people like Chodeng Akir, the former speaker, Majok Dao, who's the MP for Jiao, Nadia Arop Dudi, who's the Minister of Culture, Museums and National Heritage. All of them basically function as a sort of coterie around Taban Dengai, who is effectively controlling the politics still of the really important hires in Rueng. And as much as sort of the rhetorical move in Rueng is a populist move to denounce Taban Dengai, actually the substantive politics is one which is still beholden to him. And I think the way, and I'm going to stop after this point, but you clearly see that is when you look at what's happened to the borders of the Rohingya administrative area. So the Rohingya administrative area has made these, a variety of border claims. What's the reality? The reality is in Wunkur in the East, Wunkur has been consistently since 2014 under the control of the Agwalek and of Olon's men. And they are unable to remove those men. And I think one of the important things in the administrative area in Rueng, and we could come back to, P to GPAA on this point, is that Rueng has no army. It's not a state, right? So it does not get a division of the SPLA. So while there are self-defense forces which have supposedly been demobilized, but we know they haven't really in Rueng, and there is national security controlling the oil fields, the head of the SPLA division four for Rueng is a Bulnur. At which is an entirely unpopular appointment within the Rueng. And the NSS, which controls the oil fields, is run by a low Noor again from, uh, for a, from a, by a Bordinka from Jongle. So there, there really isn't the sort of the concerted military power that's accompanied in the administrative area. Case two of that, of course, is in Panaquach, which is the border which effectively allows there to be a contiguous link between the former two counties of Pariang and Abi Emnom has now been occupied by Carlos Quoll, who is the deputy commander of Division 4, but is an old, old um, friend and, and ally of Taban Dengai. And he wants that border crossing because, of course, it, it's very lucrative. And if they now open up the border with, South, with Sudan formally, it will become even more lucrative. When he occupies it in 2019, he kicks out the executive director for that Payam, for Alin Payam, who goes back to Pariang. And up to this day, there has been no successful attempt by the RAA, by the Rohingya administrative area, to come down and take over that area. So they remain effectively separated, the two parts sheared off from each other, and totally dominated fundamentally by a figure who is just much more powerful in the Rohingya administrative area itself because of his connection to Taban Dengai. So I think what we see as a sort of cautionary tale really is that while I think in a similar way to as Joseph was saying for the GPAA, Rueng emerges really out of a sort of a, 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 a dinka tiredness with their minoritization relative to the newer and unity state. 
what we actually see is the creation of that administrative area has made them weaker and less powerful and less able to articulate their own domains because fundamentally formal independence has not allowed them to articulate the really important question. And the really important question is substantively, how will they govern and determine their relationships with the newer communities around them? And I'll leave it there and I'll pass it over to Ferry to talk about some of these issues more broadly in South Sudan. Maybe we can pick these things up in Q&A and I encourage people to pose questions in Q&A. Uh, thanks, Joshua. I just want to follow what you said and what, what, what Joseph and, and Diana was saying about people as well. So I think the main question is like, what are the administrative areas and why do we have them? Are they states? Are they not states? Are they, as Joseph said and put it, zones of exceptions that, you know, something out of the constitution that is, that is just there as an exception. And I think one can argue that they are created to avoid the power sharing requirement of the peace agreement. Because the government, in a sense, can do whatever they want in, a, in, an, in an administrative area. And unlike the states, uh, they and they can only select the appointees, like the organized forces outside of the scope of the agreement, like the NSS, the military intelligence, commando, or these militias. These places are not bound by the agreement. You know, these places are outside of the scope of the peace agreement. This is part of the story, but it doesn't explain why don't we have more of the administrative areas? Because every ethnic community that is favorable for the government, but currently constitute a minority in that place should strive for an, for an administrative area. And we see that. I mean, I just listed a few places where I seen this in field work or where Joshua seen this is field work where people were striving for an administrative area. Lo Nuer in Akobo told us that they would like something like the Mudle. The Anuak would like to have autonomy within the GPAA with Alali Payam from Jongre also joining them, but also to have their own community, to have their own zone outside of the GPAA or an autonomy within the GPAA. So further fragmenting um, one of the administrative areas. One of the proposed solutions in the Tombira issue just very recently is an imaginary Azanda territory, a self-governing unit outside of Western Equatoria and outside of the scope of the peace agreement. Um, very interestingly, the people of Panijar, Joshua can tell you more about that, argued against the appointed commissioner who they seem as a, as a Juba sellout, somebody who is only from Juba, and they wanted self-rule and they argued, quote, something like the Mudle. And, and, and very interestingly, as a reaction, just a few weeks ago in Torib, I've seen as a reaction to the youth protests uh, by the Lotoko speaking groups, um, several NGO workers and youth union members from other ethnic communities of Magwi County, mostly Acholi and Madi, argued that, okay, the Lotoko can keep the jobs in, in Torib, but we want our own administrative unit. We want something like the Murla has. We would like to have our own country of Magwi County and all the NGOs should move to Magwi County who are serving us in Magwi. And where is the end of this? And I really like Joseph's point of like, okay, this cannot go out. We cannot have as many administrative areas as ethnic communities we have. Obviously the end result will be something, sadly so, what we see in, uh, in, in Ethiopia. Um, So this, this, I think the administrative areas promises an image of a self-rule. Um, and people are very nostalgic, for, the, for example, about the 32 states everywhere all across South Sudan, because it provided a kind of like ethnic self-rule, even though there was nothing on the ground for these states to survive, at least we had our own state, which was the promise that at one point, the telos was that at one point this can lead to um, a, a working administration. But I think, so just a few things before I stop and we open for the Q&A. We have a few things with the power sharing peace agreement right now, we have a few things on the, on the government level, which is or on the state level, which is very frustrating for the international observers and the international communities and how this is how power works and how the, the politics works in the states. And you know you have a governor appointed by either the president or one of the opposition leaders. And however, whoever he's appointing him, he or she has a deputy, again, directly appointed by the other party. An opposition governor has um, a, a government appointed deputy and vice versa. 
And the state cabinets are also split according to the peace agreement. Several ministers are appointed by the SPLM, again in Juba, while others appointed by the IO, um, again in Juba. So you have a governor and a hostile deputy governor with a cabinet that is working for or against them, but not appointed by them. And at a lower level, if you go a level lower, the commissioners are also part of the agreement. And not surprisingly, they are also all Juba appointees. And the governor has to work with the commissioners who are given to them, either by the president or by Riek Machar or other opposition leaders. So you have a structure where the governor cannot fire ministers, cannot fire commissioners, and, and all decision-making has to go through the office of the president or the vice president. And unlike this, seemingly power is more straightforward in the administrative areas. The president appoints the chief administrator, and from that point on, he appoints the cabinet, he appoints his deputy, he appoints his commissioners, and, and he even has the right, for example, to create new countries. However, while the power structure of the state is mind-blowing and so slows down decision-making, and it's extremely complicated, it also creates terrain for real politics. Governors has to compromise. They have to outpower the deputies. The deputies has to undermine them. There's a constant need for compromise, which is creating kind of like stronger figures. Uh, for example, one thing that's amazing in the States is like how the governors are now trying to appoint mayors, decreasing the, the influence of the commissioners who are appointed uh, below them and not by them. Um, this is tiresome, but this is real politics. And on the other hand, in special administrative areas, what we have, it is the, these are very weak figures. In all of the, not, not surprisingly, in all of the administrative areas, we already had several changes of leadership. And with the change of a leadership, when Salvakir is deciding that this guy is not serve, serving me any longer, let's bring in a new blood, and, and appointing a new chief administrator, all, the, all his appointments are changed again. So in a sense, they're much less stable and much more prone to, 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 to external influence. And one last point um, is that also, also, I think there's a big difference budget-wise. budget, budget wise. So the budgets for the administrative areas are not budgeted. They are not, they do not even, I, I mean, I really want to ask uh, Joseph how it works in terms of like taxation and stuff, but the, the possibilities of an administrative area to, 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 to generate their own income is much less. They are much more dependent on Juba than, than the states. So for example, when there was the IMF money that was budgeted, and there was like a one third of the money went for the, went for the states. And to my best knowledge, it went for the states and not for the administrative areas. But Joseph knows much more about, about those details. I'm very much curious how that works. But I think I stop here and pass it back to Q&A and Joseph. Thank you, Ferry. Um, Joseph, I don't know if you want to handle that immediate question, how do finances work in the administrative area? You have to unmute, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity again. I would like to uh, intervene uh, for this point, and after that I will ask uh, you to leave me to go. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, this is one of the big challenges that we have in the administrative areas. Uh, our resources for the finance came only from Juba. And, uh, and the money that even is coming from Juba is lump sums. It is not budgeted. Uh, and as you know, all the three administrative areas are under the presidency. And uh, it is just recently appointed, uh, I mean, uh, established it. And uh, 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 the, the finance is still to be arranged uh, according to the, uh, the fiscal years. Uh, so uh, this is the challenge that we have. The money that is always transferred uh, to these uh, three administrative areas is not sufficient, especially in uh, greater big border administrative area. Our local resources, uh, is very poor uh, due to the situation that we have in the area. And uh, you know, uh, the area is, uh, 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 is witnessing a lot of uh, communal conflicts. And uh, there is no uh, any opportunity for the uh, administration who is there to uh, uh, 
uh, to think about uh, how it can uh, open ways for uh, institutions that can generate the income uh, to the area. Uh, I don't have uh, uh, much uh, idea about the ruin. Uh, I think from, from our perspective, we think the ruin is a little bit uh, one of the lucky uh, administrative areas because it has a percentage uh, from the uh, oil that is produced uh, in that area. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, for for BA, I think a BA is better because uh, it is an all administrative uh, area uh, since 2005, and I think it has overcome its challenges. And a situation a little bit better because it has international border, which is open between uh, north and south. So in our situation, we are really facing a lot of challenges in greater Bipa administrative area. Our uh, financial system is not functioning well, and we don't have any generating incomes, although we have potentials and we have resources which need to be utilized. Uh, of course, uh, many of you know that uh, uh, the area uh, uh, of greater Bipa administrative area is uh, blessed with uh, wildlife and blessed with uh, gold and mine, and it's blessed with uh, soil, which is good for agriculture. Uh, but there is no uh, an opportunity uh, for us to utilize uh, those resources for the benefit of the communities in, in Greater Big Water Administrative Area due to the security situation and the communal conflict that is happening from one time to another, and uh, also the poor uh, roads uh, that we have, and a lot of things that. Uh, you can you can think about it. So this is the uh, what I can say about our financial uh, situation in Greater Bipa Administrative Area, and uh, and of course the country is witnessing a very big uh, economic crisis. As we are talking now, the whole country uh, is waiting for the salary of uh, September of the last month of the, of the last year, uh, not even two thousand and twenty one. We are waiting for the salary of uh, September 2020, uh, which means even the country itself has a problem. Uh, so this is the situation that we have in Greater Bipa Administrative Area. Thank you so much, Joseph, and thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to the next time um, we're going to talk. I mean, I, I have one, um, yeah, one question then for Ferry. I think coming back to something that you said, which is the it's interesting to think about the fact that these three administrative areas are all border communities. And this is something you mentioned to me, right? And so I think Joseph is totally right to say that Abye's advantage is it has the market, right? Like it has Amir. And Rueng's advantage really is Panaquaj, if it actually had control of Panaquaj and the refugee camps. Of course, Joseph, you're right to say that in theory, there should be 3% going to the Rueng administrative area, that 3% has never arrived and that there is a great deal of skepticism on my part that it will ever arrive. And you know, you, you can blame that on the communities not agreeing about how it should be distributed, but I think that's a sort of, uh, that's a mistake really. Like, well, they could agree or they like, this money is still not gonna come to them. But I think it is interesting, right, that we don't have, this is Ferry's point and I'm just repeating it so that I can ask him what you, does it expand on it? There aren't administrative areas in the middle of the country. There's no administrative area in lakes, in Wadap. Instead, they're mm. all border areas. They're mm. all at the edges and they all have maybe, at least potentially, some form of external relation that can generate income, but that also sort of, at least at some level, make the relationship to, I think, the natural state government different. And I, Ferry, I want to ask you about that because it's actually your point, so I don't want to steal it from you. No, my, my yeah, thanks, Joshua. My line of thinking, which is not a, a formulated theory, was that basically these are the peripheries of the peripheries. So the, the only places where you can imagine these zones of exceptions outside of the constitution, outside of everything, is where you really have no infrastructure, and which is like, just to paraphrase again, the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the edges of South Sudan, the um, the most marginalized territories, but maybe Diana has something more to say on that because she's she's the only one of us who, apart from Joseph, is living in one of the administrative areas. 
Uh, thanks, Ferry. I think actually the ways that ethnicity is experienced and the ways that uh, uh, that is experienced and that the state is experienced and imagined and, and hoped for in these peripheries um, is actually, well, the state imagines the people in a way and the people kind of imagine what they hope for of the state. And of course, with the creation of these administrative areas and the increasing sense of membership of the state is, in, is kind of accompanied by increasing expectations of the state. Um, I think there's a lot to, to be said, at least in, the, in relation to the GPA, to, to the kind of abstract sense that we now govern ourselves. Um, it, it, it's a very powerful spirit. It's a very powerful idea, uh, and especially in relation to, to kind of very historical, uh, difficult relations to, to, to Dingabor and to Jongole. So, so that, that carries a lot of weight, even if then the resources and the hopes and aspirations that the, the, the state would bring, well, that the administrative area would bring kind of concrete um, well, benefits and advantages, even if that doesn't deliver. So, you know, but I think what, what is also to be said, especially in, if we think about the GPA is that, uh, which is a multi-ethnic uh, state, the only one, uh, although it has parallels to what Josh was, was saying in terms of the internal divisions and the sections and, and, and Rueng, is that where ethnicity is kind of experienced and the meaning it has locally, um, before it starts being instrumentalized by political elites, uh, that's when it becomes kind of quite problematic and difficult to, to so I think it, the way it's lived on the ground by every by people and the relations between G and Kachipo and Murle and whatever kind of on the ground, it's when it reaches kind of a, at a more political level that it becomes problematic and difficult. Um, yeah, but just something kind of an idea to on on, on ethnic politics and these ethnic constituencies. So one question, I mean, I have for all of you, and so whoever wants to respond can respond, is both Joseph and Ferry seem pretty clear that this is sort of like an emergency measure. The administrative error is not an answer to a nation state. The administrative error is something that happens in the interim due to violence, due to conflict. And I'm sort of at, on the one level, like sympathetic to that view, but I also wonder if what we're actually seeing is something like administrative the logic of administrative areas developing throughout the country even if they don't have the name so what i mean by that for instance is what we see since the formation of the national government is that the office of the president is directly coming in and appointing county commissioners either the opposition is appointing county commissioners outside the administrative areas or the government is and when you're looking at those contestations in the rest of unity, for instance, those contestations about governor, about county commissioners are being really explicitly thought about in very, very sectional terms. So there are questions of which section takes a turn over this position. And rather than being articulated in the framework of a state, right, in which we're trying to get maybe some sort of multi-ethnic balance, I don't really think that's true what unity state was, but we'll play around with it. What you instead get is really often quite violent and politically um, conflicted tensions at the level of the county on the basis of this direct intervention by the state and uh, partly by, by, the, by the office of the president. Yeah, so while it, it seems yeah. like, uh, could you mute your mic for a second, Joseph? Oh, thank you. Um, well, well, it seems like what we have is counties and states. It feels to me often like what we actually have our county commissioners forget about the states in large part and county commissioners appointed by Juba. And that sort of logic of executive power articulating local power relative to ethnic difference seems like in some ways an inheritance of the model of the administrative area, but one that is now generalized across much of the country. I don't know if any of you would like to come back on that. No, I just agree with you. I think if you see the Tombura violence, what happened in Tombura and, and all the arguments, it's basically very clear that the fight in South Sudan or the war in South Sudan is not about land, it's about administrative control of that land. You wrote about that in, uh, in relation to the, to the Shilluk. 
that's very true also in, in, in relation to like, who should be given the right to live in a county and who should be given the right to nominate a, a, a paramount chief. And then, you know, and then all, all the questions following coming from that. And yes, all these positions, all the county commissioners are, are given the license from, or, or given the, the mandate from Juba and not from, the, not from the governor. They cannot be fired by the governor, only in exceptional circumstances. But also I think one very important point is that they're not simply given their positions, but they are not given salaries. I mean, Joseph just mentioned that they are waiting for salaries since September. So what they are given is a license, basically, to generate their own income, you know, through taxation, through taxing the humanitarians, through looting, through extending civil wars, through the, through the through 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 whatever resources they have on their land. And yes, in in this sense, the model of the of the monoethnic unit, which we have seen, it was never a monoethnic unit. It's not a monoethnic unit in, in the GPA. It is not a monoethnic unit in the, in the Rubang because it's getting to split the moment you create it. It won't be a monoethnic unit if you create an Azande administrative area. In the, 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 that moment, it would start to, 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 to crack and you know, they would demand more and more splits. I mean, I, I guess just to add to that, I guess this is also what we see then uh, and what Joshua was uh, describing to some extent is the state kind of producing and further essentializing ethnic identities. Um, and, and also the, these appointments from Juba of a, a county commissioner of a particular section. It, it, and I wonder if this, well, this is very much kind of, a, it, it feels quite uh, uh, targeted or quite deliberate as well. Uh, the kind of the standard divide and rule, I guess, ultimately as well, but whether there is a, I, I think there is something promising to, to, to take from this as well, which is the flexibility of identities. As much as they can be essentialized, they can also be de-essentialized as well, and, and they are kind of movable, moving and mutable and ever-changing. I don't know, it's just kind of an, a possible, a more positive take from the, what we've been seeing uh, over the past years as well, and and how they can also be kind of then uh, strategically deployed by people and by kind of minority groups to some extent. So I don't know if you have anything to, to say in relation to that or just something, well, a positive take of things in a way. Uh, I, we've, got to, we've got to have a positive, I mean, I, I, yeah. I take your point and I've, you know, I've just been um, reading some of Dana's work and there is like a great deal of positivity in the fact that, and at least I think we could even sort of paradoxically find something positive in the bleakness with which government instrumentalization works, right? Which is that against sort of very common narratives in 2013 that we heard, which is like the Dinka against the Noor, and this is an eternal endless war. What we actually find are things are much more sophisticated than that, right? And like, even in the logic of Ruang, which officially is a logic that says like, what we want is autonomy from the Noor. What we actually find is the very first thing is that a group of a law politicians make common cause with the guy to try to exclude the Panaru of Parian, who have previously been the, you know, the controlling group as it were in Rueng. So even in those sort of ways, I think that we see that identity is gonna be mobilized politically. It's gonna be affected by material economic constraints. And as much, I think, the problem is not ethnicity, no? Like the problem is, is that the, and I think that the great sort of irony, the horrible irony is that while we see an increasingly ethnicized and also like, I don't want to say ethnicized, like sectionalized politics, a politics more and more based on difference and less and less based on broader compacts. It's also a politics which, which is more centralized, right? Which is more controlled by the government, which is more dependent on the largesse, on the direct control by the office of the president. So we have these two double things, which is on the one hand, the promise of the GPAA, the, the promise of, of Rueng for the Lonur is that they finally get independence. But the process of being individualized and independent sized these are terrible verbs, but the, pro the, the, the project of sort of becoming independent communities is actually the project by which they're getting weaker relative to the government that's often controlling those processes, instrumentalizing them and separating them. Okay, it sounds like I'm just saying bad stuff again, but to find like the positive aspect of that is that it's really not a process about ethnicity per se. It's not a process about ethnic division at all. I think it's a process of the government trying to work via isolation and trying to work via 
putting factions against each other, putting groups against each other, and sometimes it's expressed through ethnicity, but just as often it's expressed at the subsectional level. There is the silence of either deep disagreement or deep thought among the, the rest of the panelists. I mean, well, I guess my question to you guys is, why does this model not just continue? Like, uh, this is, a, again, a negative question, not a positive one. Like, it felt to me like in what both Joseph and Ferry were saying is like, and I'm just an early, reformulated earlier question, but, oh, we're going to get somewhere else. We're going to get somewhere better. But that's not the logic of what's happened since 2018. The logic of 2018 has been more and more splits and divisions and more and more instrumentalization. So especially as we're now approaching elections and there are members of the UN in the audience, uh, we might be approaching elections. Why would elections not produce just like far greater um, examples of this sort of instrumentalization or ethnicity and sectional difference? I mean, I actually want to challenge what you said, what you say in relation to the GPA. I think things have become better. Uh, and, and well, of course, it depends on according to who, according to the who's, uh, if you're speaking to someone from Meun or from uh, Kathingor or from, uh, well, from where, uh, they have been very brutal communal violence or intercommunal violence uh, from uh, with, with Launwer and, and, and Inca. Uh, the neighboring Dinka Bor communities, but these have been largely sponsored uh, by uh, kind of well formal government, well formal military structures, either IO or or, or the government. Um, that again kind of connects to what you're saying to the national to the power at central level and how that kind of inf influences and, and, and meddles with with the, the potential stability and and success of these areas, uh, but. But otherwise, you can see kind of quite, I mean, and also in relation to Christina's question in relation in, in, in terms of age set fighting, we have what have, we've also, and Joseph said it is effectively sort of part of society, age sets are, are as they, they can, they're, they promote as much unity as disunity these days, and that's largely because actually, since, especially since independence, uh, they have more and more become instrument, instrumentalized, and some people refer to them as political parties now. Age sets have become kind of close to political parties and are used by political elites for their own, uh, well, aspirations, political aspirations. Uh, so, so age set fighting has become, for the reasons jo Joseph mentioned, uh, quite dramatic and, and, and different from what it used to be. Uh, but also because they have become increasingly politicized and political uh, and lost and, and, and moved away from what they used to be in a way. Um, but, but I do think there's still, uh, there are concrete uh, outcomes in the GPA for the people of the GPA. Uh, people are living better, but they're not, I think, to some, yeah just to challenge the that this is all you know the, the bleak picture that you you were yeah yeah i mean I, and i wouldn't like obviously i'm i'm not going to challenge anything that you yeah. and um, joseph say about the gpa i guess that's a pattern of like politics around the country that we've seen right which is the office of the president directly in, in going in and, and organizing county commissioner and you see the resultant violence in maywood uh mayandit panijar uh guit coach you know, so I, that wasn't even, it wasn't yeah. a reflection on the GPAA, that was a reflection on what I'm seeing as yeah. a countrywide pattern. Yeah, I, I mean, again, connecting to the broader na national dynamics, and especially the, the first few years of the national conflict, the, the GPA actually experienced a piece of, relative, probably the most peaceful period since the, since the signing of the CPA, because uh, they were no longer being the, the scapegoat or the, the, the nasty other, they were bigger kind of, dynamics at play that left them alone. And so they had the possibility of prospering and of kind of getting on with life to some extent. Uh, of course, with the peace, with a national peace agreement uh, that changed for them. And they again became sort of the, well, the, the standard scapegoat <laughs> to some extent. Um, again, this is not a very positive, well, and they, they will remain as such for, unfortunately to, um, yeah, but but yeah, but back to your question, I guess, in terms of what this means for for national elections, maybe Ferry has something to say. I'm not sure I, I have much to add there. 
I mean, I guess it depends on if which form national elections will take place. You know, if it's um, if it's some kind of a census and where people are imagining of like we have to win, won, we have to win, you know, uh, some mathematical wars or demographic wars, then it will be very violent, obviously, because then it will be tied to displacement. It will be tied to um, how can you count people? How can you not count people that you don't want to count? So you create insecurities and chase away people and move back other people. So, I mean, you know, Joshua, what I'm, 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 I mean here, but, uh, but I agree with you. I think that the general model of the center is getting uh, further down and down in the chain is, uh, is obvious. I'm very much curious what will happen when we reach to the level of like then now, who will appoint, the, for example, the fire administrators, because that's the next step that's coming. Will that be the governor? Or again, it will be somebody from Juba in some cases deciding, or will it be the county commissioner given the chance to appoint his own people? I guess it's uh, it's super interesting. One very interesting thing or the difference between the, between the um, GPAA, for example, and states is that the, the chief administrator do have the right to create own counties. So the GPAA does not have the two historical counties. So the can so South Sudan never returned to the 79 original counties or the 80 with, with, with Bali. Um, but GPA has, I think, nine counties, four in Pochala, or maybe 11 counties, and four in Pochala, seven in, uh, in Pibo. Diana knows more. Uh, two, actually, a few, less, less. less uh, okay. This is contested, of course. I mean, again, I think this then goes back to the divisions and the kind of political um, struggles within the areas that, you know, between, especially in, in a multi-ethnic, uh, yeah. Yeah, so there's two official counties. Two, two uh, official, Anua. but yeah, two two Anua countries and four or five. Four, uh, yeah, three exclusively Murle and one uh, multi. Yeah. Well, then Jebel Boma, yeah. But then more than the official number of countries should yeah, be. Yeah, for the, sure. The yeah. And all of them are SPLM appointees. All of them are appointees by the by the chief administrator. Anyway, I don't want to get too much into details, but yeah. I think that's a, another interesting difference between the administrative areas. So basically, what you have here is Payams nominated to become counties and then appointed by the chief administrator. Uh, we have a question from the audience and it's a question about positivity. So Diana, I'm looking at you. How would you go about creating spaces in which approaches towards or elements of positive ethnicity could be discussed at local and at national levels? Sorry, can you, I, I can't see the question. Do you mind reading it again? Yeah. How would you go about creating spaces in which approaches towards or elements of positive ethnicity could be discussed at local and at national levels? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, the challenge is about, I, I think, oh, well, it, it's not even a very positive start, the challenge, start with the, the challenges, but, uh, one, I, I remember kind of a positive take or I remember there was a quite a, 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 um, a competent Shiluk operating in Boma uh, in the in the Payam uh, administration in Boma at one point. And that was, you know, it, it, it comes down to, to competency uh, to, uh, well, to doing a good job <laughs> as well and sort of, and also to being removed from the kind of the politics of the area. Uh, to some extent. So maybe drawing, you know, mixing around, bringing people that are not from the area, that of course has potential, uh, as was this case, that maybe was connected to this particular individual. And it also involves a lot of risks. And, and that's why, for example, uh, actually it has likely more risks than, uh, than potential in a way, but that's why, for example, the deputy administrator of the GPA, who is an ANUAC, traditionally has been an ANUAC, has very little influence and ability to solve uh, intramural issues. How to go about that? I mean, you know, in in, in areas that are mostly rural, uh, that well, in, in the GPA, the majority of the people are still living in rural areas where the state, the official state is not present, where customary authorities handle everyday issues and everyday life. And so you the customary authorities are connected to those areas and draw their power from those areas and from the, those histories and those kind of social uh, institutions. 
So it's very difficult to then have along, come along an Anuak as, as respected and competent as he might be and, and, and kind of engage in those, in, in, well, in those everyday issues. And, and so that's not a very promising take, I think, but uh, positive ethnicities, I think, I think culture, the kind of the practical dimensions of culture, song, uh, music, uh, uh, dance. I think there's 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 a lot. There's a that's a huge space uh, to um, that could be kind of untapped. And in, in all the major cities, in back in um, well, in 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 Malakal in Bor, you had kind of every Sunday you had kind of uh, open, you know, diff the different communities of that state coming together to dance. Uh, so that's, I think, kind of a promising area and, and, and something to be kind of untapped. Um, and, 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 and I think there is much more intermarriage and much more connection and the way ethnicity is experienced at the local level is actually much uh, more fluid and, and much more uh, constructive than when it again reaches these sort of more high level political discussions or these political discussions. So the realities are much more intertwined uh, and connected. Maybe Ferry, Joshua, you have something to add? <laughs> sure, thank you, Dan. I thought that was all really good. I mean, I think just in the phrasing of the question, how would you go about creating spaces in which approaches or elements of positive ethnicity could be discussed? I think also a lot of, this is like a positive negative, but I think a lot of the negative ethnicity as it were, is not pre-existent, and it's written something Diana said, it's created by political struggles, right? It's created by the fact that the way in which the office of the president is often ruling is by creating zero sum administrative con conflicts. So if you go to, I was just in Malakal and you sit with people, there are still lots of memories of 2008, not that it was some you know, like high clear age, but it was a moment at which Malakal was, and I remember Malakal at that time, like a genuinely multicultural diverse city. And the reasons it's not, is not because the Badang hate the Shiluk or the Shiluk hate the Badang and the newer don't like either of them. It's because the way that political power has been set up has been to reward zero sum contests for administrative power between different groups. And I think that's actually the level at which one has to articulate the problem. Like I think that there's too much of the way in which humanitarians and peace builders, the UN, black and otherwise thinks about violence in South Sudan is to take the unit of the problematic unit as the ethnic bloc as if that ethnic block as a problem somehow pre-exists the political struggles in which it finds itself. And it doesn't, right? Like in a, not in any meaningful way as like a political unit. Like, of course the Shiluk exists, it's a royal kingdom, you know, for a long time, I'm not like denouncing the existence of the Shiluk, obviously not. I wrote like 120 pages on their history, but the idea that somehow the Shiluk have these like deep land issues with the Padang is just, wrong right like you really see them emerge okay a bit in the 80s but really it's not until the 2000s and the logic of governance and of liberal peace after the signing of the cpa so i think if we start like the problem with the international response is that then they think it's about ethnic units therefore what we need to do is we need to get everyone around a table and we need to do some peace building but and I think this is different in Jonglei, and I'm not an expert on Jonglei, so I'm not going to speak about Jonglei and the GPA. But in Upper Nile, where I have slightly more, but not that much, but slightly more confidence in speaking, it's absurd. Like, there's no why are you going to bring a bunch of Padang and a bunch of Shilluk around the table? The problem is not that people can't get along, is that they haven't gotten along for 200 years in different ways with a whole series of very established forms of arranging cattle movements and arranging land problems and arranging different legal systems. All of this is complicated and nuanced and they have it. The problem is, is that MI24 helicopters were used by a political elite who instrumentalized ethnic differences to destroy hospitals. And we have a political system which has effectively legitimized those land grabs at the level of law and at the level of politics. And it's those very politicians that NGOs are going to to get support for their ethnic into ethnic meetings. That seems to me entirely the wrong way of going about it, right? Like these are genuinely political problems that cannot be addressed at a communitarian level because they're expressed as communitarian struggles because they're political problems first, 
not communitarian problems first. Yeah, just to just to add to that, when I was in uh, in Western Equatoria recently, when I asked people of like, okay, but how can this issue be approached? You know, how can this issue be resolved? You think like you know the the, the solution of intercommunal dialogue, what what? And the people were like, like, no, that's absolutely not the level of the problem. The level of the problem is political. The level of the problem is in Juba. You have to bring the top guys in Juba to make an agreement, and then you can move on forward. So it's completely in line with what just to describe Joshua is back. The level of solution is not at that block where the international community is seeing the problem. I mean, I'm just going to reinforce what both of you, what, what, what you've just said, but, uh, you know, the, the again, in fact, uh, if, if anything, the, the emergence of the GPA in the, so those first few years of relative peace, um, when they were left alone, uh, reinforces your point that without kind of the broader political maneuverings or meddling or kind of involvement, uh, people are able to coexist and kind of get on with life much more. Uh, and last year's very, very well violent intercommunal uh, violence uh, affecting Wumuruk and, and kind of the border areas of the, the GPA were, as I was mentioning earlier, I mean, very much uh, supported or drawing on the, the resources of the state or of the IO to attack, well, to what was then presented as intercommunal violence. So let's do another peace talk. Actually, it, as you're saying, it is a political, these are political, uh, highly political process, a uh, kind of involvement that are, are you know, and and uh, and the consequences are, are are significant for, I mean, now you have towns in, in the GPAA, uh, Murle towns that are full of people that have no longer, that, that are cattle keepers with no cattle, uh, that are entirely dependent on humanitarian, you know, their cattle has been completely taken, depleted, and they're dependent on humanitarian uh, handouts and and uh, yeah and and towns that are kind of bloating. It's both. I mean, actually, in discussion with Joseph yesterday, he was mentioned this as also as an opportunity actually for uh, bringing in well, keep taking people to kids to school because in in that were previously kind of dispersed and. Uh, so they're both kind of again they're um, they're also opportunities in these new dynamics in these towns that are kind of increasing in size because of people no longer being able to to to, well, to, to survive in, in in you know well with their livelihoods, but um, but yeah again it's it's communal it's not communal violence it it, it is not communal responses they, they are kind of political issues that require kind of uh, well uh, responses at that level. Or at least recognizing that is certainly the first step. Yeah. Well, as uh, do you any do you have any of you have any burning last words? Because we have no more questions from the audience, and I don't want to keep people later than they need to wherever they are in the world. It's coming up to seven here in Nairobi. And um, very any last moments of genius, Diana? No, you've well Thanks. exhausted all my <laughs> exhausted all your genius. I find it hard to believe, but. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for attending. Um, I'm not sure when the next webinar will be, but no doubt Christopher will keep us updated via email. And I wish you all a really pleasant weekend.